Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month. You'll get unlimited access to the news you need to stay engaged and connected to your community. Visit Inforum.com slash subscribe now to get three months of local news for only 99 cents a month. How a boxing match between champ Jack Dempsey and a popular Minnesotan nearly destroyed a tiny Montana town. On July 4th, 1923, 100 years ago, 3,000 people swarmed the Fargo Forum to get the as-it-happens news of the fight. But the aftermath of the brawl was far more interesting. Hi, this is Tracy Briggs, and welcome to Back Then. It must have gone through the minds of many in Fargo-Moorhead that July 4th, 1923. What better way to celebrate America, they thought, than to cheer on a Minnesota guy, an underdog, hoping to take down a world champion. They would eventually also surprise him in the middle of the night, in his pajamas. More on that later. Some called it the fight of the summer, that Independence Day 100 years ago, as Minnesota boxer Tommy Gibbons challenged the heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Dempsey. With the fight happening 800 miles away in Shelby, Montana, most people in town couldn't afford the trip. And with only 1% of American households in possession of a radio, most here also couldn't listen to the play-by-play at home. So what was a local boxing fan supposed to do? Well, about 3,000 of them headed to downtown Fargo and gathered around the Fargo Forum newspaper building to listen to a megaphone man shout out the blow-by-blow, round-by-round action from an office window. Now, this is where you should go to our website, inform.com. If you would like to see a photo, there's kind of a cool photo, uh, panoramic photo of all these people packed outside the building. It's pretty fascinating stuff. According to newspaper reports, the crowd filled the block between the Masonic Temple, the Forum, and Northwestern Bell. According to a map provided by Mark Peel of the Clay County Historical Society, that's basically the area of First Avenue between 4th and 5th Streets North between what is now Gate City Bank and the Fargo Public Library. Cars at first filled First Avenue in front of the window of the form offices where the report was being megaphoned, but drivers were eventually asked to move their cars to make room for the many people standing and listening. According to the newspaper, it was the biggest crowd that ever attended a newspaper party in Fargo and was double the size of any crowd that ever attended a form election party to listen to election returns as they came in. So what was all the fuss? Well, let's put it this way. Jack Dempsey was a huge star, the world heavyweight boxing champion from 1919 to 1926. More popular, some said, than Babe Ruth. Consider his biography from Encyclopedia.com. William Jack Harrison Dempsey ushered in the age of big-time sports. His rise from hobo to heavyweight champion to Hollywood celebrity not only gave boxing the stamp of legitimacy, but became the prototype for every superstar athlete that followed. So when Minnesota boxer Tommy Gibbons got the chance to challenge Dempsey for his title— you can bet his fellow upper Midwesterners would be rooting for him to win. Tommy Gibbons was born in a boxing family in St. Paul in 1891. In his biography in the International Boxing Hall of Fame, Gibbons was said to have learned to box at the YMCA when he was just a kid. He followed his older brother Mike into the ring. Tommy Gibbons turned pro when he was 20, fighting first as a welterweight and later becoming a middleweight and heavyweight. At the age of 33, he was considered a little past his prime to take on Dempsey, but he had made enough of a name for himself and packed a powerful enough punch to earn his shot. The fight took place in tiny Shelby, a northwestern Montana town with a population of around 500. It seems like an odd place to have a fight, but city leaders had a plan. You see, just the year before, oil had been discovered in Shelby. The town already had train service, so leaders figured if they could host a major sporting event, they could attract new businesses and tourists to town. 
they could use their new oil revenue to help build a huge boxing venue and offset other costs of the match, including paying the boxers. The boxing ring was built on top of a farm field, and Shelby was ready to host the match, and people lining the streets of downtown Fargo were ready to listen. Going into the fight, Gibbons was confident, but no doubt he was a definite underdog. He was older and smaller than the champ. Some analysts predicted he wouldn't last the entire fight. J.A. Purcell, the sports editor, or as they called it back then, the sporting editor of the form, said Gibbons' ability to dodge Dempsey's blows might be his best strategy. Purcell contended that punching at an empty space rather than landing a hard punch is harder on a fighter's endurance. So, therefore, the key would be to tire Dempsey out rather than match him punch by punch. Purcell said, The St. Paul man is not nearly as rugged as the champion, and for him to attempt to put up a give-and-take fight would be the height of foolishness. When the fight started, both men seemed to have their own strategy. Dempsey was throwing punches to Gibbons' head, and Gibbons was attacking Dempsey's body. Gibbons was able to duck from many of Dempsey's shots, probably making it easier for him to stay in the fight. Dempsey's mobility, however, made it hard for Gibbons to punch Dempsey's stomach and ribs. The crowd lining the street in Fargo hung on every word from that megaphone man and cheered Tommy with every punch. The match lasted the full 15 rounds, with Dempsey winning by decision and retaining his title. But what happened after the fight in both Shelby, Montana and Fargo, North Dakota, would keep things interesting. With the fight now over, film crews back in Shelby, who were there from all over the country, had to hop on planes to get their film back to their respective audiences. And that would not be easy. The planes battled a fierce electrical storm in eastern Montana that night that caused the white-knuckled sports writers and photographers to say a few Hail Marys. Many of the planes heading to markets on the East Coast had to make pit stops in Fargo, making the airport in Fargo extra busy for a Wednesday night. For readers in Fargo, Thursday morning's paper brought written news and photos from the fight they'd only heard via megaphone the day before. The form seemed exceedingly proud of what they called their timely coverage. Two photos of the fight ran on the front page just 21 hours after the conclusion of the fight. That was pretty remarkable back then. But more excitement was to come. The form also announced that Tommy Gibbons would be rolling through town on his train back to St. Paul. A crowd of 2,000 people showed up at the Northern Pacific Depot in Fargo at 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, 1 o'clock in the morning on July 7th. They apparently wanted to show their appreciation to the man the form said, quote, had earned a spot in the hearts of American fans, end quote, by staying the full 15 rounds and ruining Dempsey's knockout record. Given the late hour, Gibbons was in his pajamas, asleep in his stateroom when the train pulled into Fargo, and toward the crowd, he didn't even know it gathered. According to the form, he was agreeably surprised when awakened from his slumbers by the shouting and thunderous cheers of his admirers. The form went on to say, The likable boxer donned a bathrobe to greet his friends. Gibbons thanked them for their moral support and spoke at length. In fact, the train reportedly started pulling out of the station while Gibbons was still addressing the crowd. Despite the popularity of the fight in places like Fargo, it was a bust for the city that hosted it. Ticket sales were disappointing. Many in Shelby and nearby communities couldn't even afford to buy tickets. Attendance was estimated between 8,000 and 12,000 in an arena some said could hold about 40,000. Only some of the attendees actually bought tickets, despite Shelby organizers offering a last-minute discount. Many people, in fact, were able to watch it without paying a penny. It seems ticket takers and sellers left their posts when the match began so they could go inside and watch it for themselves. With their posts now unguarded, the line of people who might have actually purchased those discounted last-minute tickets, no, they just walked inside without paying. Because Shelby had guaranteed payments to the fighters, it was a financial disaster. Reports differ on exactly how many banks in Shelby failed as a result of the fight, 
but it appears to be at least two and as many as four. Jack Dempsey and his manager, Jack Kearns, walked away with around $300,000. That's about $5.2 million in today's dollars. In 1989, the LA Times called Kearns, the manager, one of the greatest sports con men of the century. He was accused of taking advantage of the naivete of Shelby. And in fact, Kearns was said to have frequently joked later in life about, quote, the banks Jack and I broke in Montana, end quote. Because Gibbons was the challenger and eager to take on Dempsey, his deal, of course, was much less lucrative. He agreed to get paid beyond expenses only if there were money left over after Dempsey's cut. Of course there wasn't. So he walked away with nothing except $2,500 to cover his expenses. So what happened to the fighters and Shelby, Montana? Well, Jack Dempsey, the champ, kept fighting, but eventually lost his title to another underdog in 1926, Gene Tooney. He continued to do exhibition matches and a rematch with Tooney, but he stopped fighting for good to become a philanthropist and actor in the 1930s. He made a little bit of a comeback in the 40s, but then also served in the military in World War II. He later became a restaurateur and an author. He died in 1983 at the age of 87. His boxing record was 69, 6, and 9. Gibbons would retire from boxing in 1925, just a couple of years after that fight in Montana. He actually would get knocked out also by Dempsey's nemesis, Gene Tooney. His record was an impressive 55, 4, and 1. He once said he left boxing, quote, while I still had my senses, end quote. According to the Minneapolis Star, Gibbons was well-liked, generous, and tremendously popular. In fact, Gibbons was actually elected Ramsey County Sheriff and served for 24 years before retiring in 1959. He also enjoyed spending time in his lake home in Osakis, Minnesota. He died in 1960 at the age of 69. The town at the heart of the financial disaster, Shelby, got back up after its knockout. The town now has a population of around 3,100, and it actually embraces that chapter in its history. In fact, organizers in Shelby are holding a centennial event on July 4th at the site of the fight. Now, people of Fargo-Morad, of course, you're welcome to stand outside the sidewalk of the forum in hopes that you can hear news from that Shelby event that day. But so far, we haven't been able to hire a megaphone man. So you best just go online for your news. And that is Back Then. Thanks for joining me this week. Hope to catch you again next time. If you're loving this podcast, be sure to check out our full lineup. From news and local politics to sports and true crime, find your next great listen right now at inforum.com slash podcasts. That's inforum.com slash podcasts.